Hello, I'm Mishka, and uh, this channel is the Helsinki Renaissance, where we will be talking about arts and culture, and hopefully the most Renaissance man like manner with arts and culture may be discussed. At least that's the plan. Now, I was just watching uh, a certain other YouTuber's video where he was outlining uh, the different shades that uh, pretension may take in cinema, and uh, charting some of its unappealing characteristics and uh, one of the less annoying possibilities for pretension apparently um, according to him was uh, a Jean Cocteau movie called uh, The Testament of Orpheus and uh, I wouldn't uh, do a video addressing just one person's opinion but uh, it just so happens that I've heard multiple people uh, make sort of similar uh, comments about the Testament of Orpheus, uh, which was Cocteau's last feature film, that uh, perhaps it's worth uh, addressing the uh, project on some level, because it seems like, uh, uh, well people who, audiences who are sympathetic to Jean Cocteau for the most part still have a tendency to reject the Testament of Orpheus uh, for, uh, well, for many reasons, but uh, uh, the uh, main arguments against it tend to be that uh, they think that it lacks substance that uh, there is some sort of a uh, self-indulgent quality to it and uh, it just seems like such a um, trifling work that uh, most people that I've heard talk about it tend to reject it in different ways. So uh, uh, anyway, uh, I won't so much defend uh, uh, the Testament of Orpheus, but I'll rationalize uh, some of the different elements about it to the best of my ability, uh, because, again, I've heard multiple people talk against it, and uh, I've never particularly liked the movie myself, but I feel like I understand uh, it perhaps a bit better than some audiences who are nothing but perplexed about that uh, stuff and things that uh, make up uh, the Testament of Orpheus. So the first thing to say about it is that, that the uh, secondary title or subtitle, whatever you want to call it, of uh, the Testament of Orpe Orpheus is uh, in French, uh, Ne me demande pas pourquoi, or, or in English, uh, the Testament of Orpheus, or don't ask me to don't ask me why, uh, which uh, to me always seemed like it's Cocteau's way of saying that uh, he, the first point that he realizes that the film won't be popular with general audiences, and then secondly, that uh, he doesn't wish to enter any kind of debates about the aesthetic merits of the Testament of Orpheus, that he's essentially saying that the movie is what it is and he plans on leaving it that way. So if anyone has a problem with it, it's their problem and not Jean Cocteau's problem, as it were. So to me, the uh, Ne me demande pas, pas pourquoi seems like a pretty you know, direct way of signaling uh, from the direct from the writer director's part that uh, the movie will be what it is and he did it with the full knowledge that uh, the movie wouldn't be as warmly embraced as some of his other uh, directorial efforts so uh, you know I just feel like that's uh, that's a good starting point in that uh, the uh, secondary title is there for a reason and uh, you know, uh, I think it just indicates uh, what uh, Cocteau's own views about 
its aesthetic positioning, uh, you know, regarding his body of work and the public would be in that, uh, you know, the, the secondary title that the film has is almost uh, amounts to a shrug, where Cocteau's just saying that, you know, what are you going to do? You know, <laughs> the film is what it is. Uh, so, uh, you know, just uh, as, as far as the charge against uh, pretension is concerned, I think it's pretty clear from that secondary title of Testament of Orpheus that Cocteau under no circumstances is pretending like the movie is something that it isn't in that he he owns up that the movie is only what it is uh, and uh, again uh, Cocteau refuses to worry about uh, its aesthetic positioning uh, regarding to the kind of general culture at large at least that's how it appears to me uh, now, I don't think that, like, I understand uh, what people are after if they accuse some movie like uh, uh, Testament of Orpheus as having something pretentious about it. I just think that it's a misnomer uh, in that uh, I think that what people mean to accuse it is uh, something else in that uh, I, I feel like the movie is extremely blatant and upfront that uh, it plans on being one thing only and it in no way equivocates on what it is uh, in that the kind of charges of self-indulgence etc I think that they just land a lot better if you absolutely must dismiss the movie some way and I feel like Cocteau anticipated it and sort of already took the stance that he doesn't wish to engage with such things at all. He just, he made the movie, he made it for himself in all likelihood, perhaps for some people who are around him, and he just takes absolutely no pressure for the movie to be anything, uh, anything other than what it is. So if you take such an angle to it, you, you might almost say that almost every other movie has pretensions of being this and that versus the Testament of Orpheus almost alone uh, accepts the kind of smaller niche positioning out of which it doesn't uh, wish to uh, depart anywhere. But uh, I'll just say that in passing, uh, not as an attempt at um, sort of defending the film, uh, you know, like I, I feel like the film doesn't really need a defense and the movie doesn't really need any kind of uh, criticism to it. I just feel like uh, what it needs is certain kind of contextualizing, which is what I'm trying to do in that. Again, as I said earlier, I personally don't particularly like the Testament of Orpheus. Uh, so uh, that's why I'm not particularly inclined to exactly defend it, but uh, I'll try to make some sort of a video about it. In that, uh, to me, uh, I remember reading some sort of a non-fiction, I don't know, overview of uh, Jean Cocteau's career, but uh, some, whoever the critic or historian who wrote it uh, was very negative towards the Testament of Orpheus and thought that uh, it, it would effectively that the movie would only play to people who would, as it were, like Jean Cocteau uncritically and would just accept whatever from him as, uh, you know, good enough. Uh, you know, I understand why somebody would, would think that, uh, but, you know, since I've never particularly liked Testament of Orpheus myself, I don't really have an opinion about what kind of audience members like it. But some of the criticism uh, that the critics last historian who wrote the book whose name I've already forgotten, uh, when, when he criticized the Testament of Orpheus, uh, 
he did seem to rather miss the point in a lot of the moments that make up the Testament of Orpheus, uh, which is not to say that, uh, uh, you know, with the correct uh, contextualization that, that the movie would be rendered uh, enjoyable, but certainly uh, a lot of the moments would feel less dada uh, if uh, there was the appropriate context. So basically the thing to say about Jean Cocteau is that uh, for most of his life, he, he eff effectively had this kind of strange tongue with artistic scandals throughout his life. So for film buffs, perhaps the first uh, Cocteau-related scandal or scandals uh, in plural probably were around uh, the release of his debut film called Blood of the Poet, where uh, uh, people, like history looks different in the kind of wide shot, in that in the close-up there were fierce battles uh, involved with surrealism, in that uh, there was some sort of a almost fight club type nature to how surrealism played on the ground level, in that it was a wildly radical and subversive movement just in general, but uh, you know, how the surrealists were amongst each other, how they positioned themselves against other artists, against the public at large, against audiences, there was there was a massive subversive streak to surrealism, which uh, people don't really uh, think of it in those terms. They, you know, individuals like Salvador Dali, etc., they've almost rendered surrealism cute in the kind of public consciousness in that uh, people do think of surrealism in somewhat wacky terms whereas the, the individuals on ground level of surrealism they saw themselves as some sort of uh, uh, you know Danton and Robespierre of aesthetics in that they considered themselves revolutionaries in the kind of fullest sense of the word and one of those uh, battles, as it were, that uh, surrealists had, uh, is that uh, they very much considered that Jean Cocteau would have tried to sort of check their style and would have tried to, um, you know, cash in on the movement that they created. So that the surrealists initially very much rejected Jean Cocteau as a surrealist filmmaker, and they thought that Dali and Bunuel would have had the kind of official surrealist movies with uh, Lars Dor and uh, and Shin Andalou. So, uh, you know, history sort of flattens all of this and just says that there was a bunch of surrealists and they wanted to do things in, a, in an anti-normative manner and there's just kind of a lowest common denominator of how it is that... Uh, uh, this kind of uh, anti-normative uh, aesthetic was, was supposed to happen. But like people just sort of casually lump Cocteau with those others, but like there were multiple scandals that, you know, the, when the surrealists rejected effectively the rest of society, the rest of society very much rejected them initially. So that there was this kind of brawl about how it is that surrealists tried to have their own, you know, place in the sun and all of that. So, you know, it, it was a more tumultuous period than it might appear in the kind of wide shot of history. But, but anyway, so if all of that was Cocteau's, um, the, the beginning of his film career, uh, and, you know, he had kind of a strange time uh about it in that I think these like there there certainly was um was a generation in uh, French art who did not primarily consider Jean Cocteau a film director so that he had uh, some other work he, like um 
you know, he, Sean Cocteau, he wrote the dialogue to Robert Bresson movie called um, uh, Le Dame du Bois de Boulogne. Uh, and uh, I think Cocteau was better. Like the hits that Cocteau had, I think that they tended to be in theater. And then he was this kind of multimedia personality who was, you know, doing a bit... Uh, you know, he was this kind of man about town and he was sort of everywhere, you know, <laughs> from uh, managing welterweight boxers to, you know, later on this kind of avant-garde composers like uh, Poulenc and doing some, uh, you know, uh, fresco paintings in uh, seaside churches and whatever. Like Cocteau was just absolutely everywhere. But uh, it wasn't in any way apparent that he would have been primarily known as a filmmaker. I think for a decent amount of people, like the hits that Cocteau had, they probably tended to be uh, in theater and then uh, as a literary person, whether non-fiction or fiction, I think that all of those tended to be bigger hits. Uh, and then... Uh, then when the French film, and film industry uh, was restarted after the occupation, uh, for whatever reason, they, they decided to have Jean Cocteau effectively launch it uh, with Beauty and the Beast in 1945. Marcel Carnet, his uh, uh, Les Enfants du Paradis, uh, it was also around that time, but but like, uh, you know, Cocteau, he had uh, obviously a tumultuous ride uh, with various kind of, uh, uh, you know, peculiarities in that kind of occupation period where uh, he, uh, you know, uh, lots of people had a rough ride. Then, obviously, due to his private life, there were certain things that didn't... Uh, Re- he wasn't regarded as entirely the right sort because of certain situations. And uh, there, there were these kind of uh, dramas around, uh, you know, whether he was uh, uh, anti-occupiers enough. And then, you know, people like Louis Aragon needed to come to Cocteau's defense into saying that uh, he did not, uh, did not sell out or you know, did not uh, abandon his, uh, uh, the good French stances that he was meant to have and so on. Um, But anyway, uh, you know, Cocteau, through the kind of supposedly better part of his career, he had kind of a weird time at it in that he was sort of all over the place and uh, he didn't really have a very stable through line and then in the kind of post-war uh, some of the kind of um, uh, some of the taxation realities in post-war France uh, were such that risk investment which is what effectively art is uh, there were these kind of disruptions that again in the wide shot of history that aren't at all apparent, but like, uh, you know, Cocteau, he was very much just, like, the reason why he was so prolific is because he just, he was kind of living a hand-to-mouth existence, even though he, he had hits all, all over the place, but because of the kind of provisioning difficulties were such that uh, he just, he needed to write like 20, 30 books just, just to get by, and, uh, you know, without certain kind of uh, artistic patronage, a lot of the kind of signature moments of Cocteau's career just couldn't, just flatly couldn't have happened. Uh, So then, you know, you had a bunch of other scandals in the post-war period. Uh, uh, François Mauriac, uh, for instance, kept accusing Cocteau of not not being the right sort. Lots of other people just kept going at Cocteau of... uh, you know, he was always accused of being too much this or not enough that. And uh, basically, his public life was was this kind of situation that he was just improbably going from success to success. But uh, 
he was just always sort of treated as uh, as if he was just failing up what his with his career in that he wasn't ever quite accepted. People definitely treated him uh, as some sort of a jack of all trades, uh, but a master of none, uh, which is not uh, exactly his present day reputation in the West, where people do think rather highly of him as a filmmaker. But uh, I would say that uh, the Les Enfants Terribles uh, Thomas uh, Lambester, uh, that uh, those kinds of novels, uh, for instance, probably were what his public reputation was hanging on far more than uh, him as any kind of director of Orpheus from 1950 uh, or something like that. In that uh, I think that people referred to him as a poet for convenience uh, rather than that that would have in fine be uh, what uh, was the media that people would have been consuming from him uh, in that uh, uh, it was probably just easy to refer everything that he did uh, as sort of poetic, uh, you know, one way or another. But uh, uh, but anyway, it's just worth pointing out that uh, when Jean Cocteau arrived uh, to the Testament of Orpheus, uh, obviously, if you know anything about recent French history, you realize that the kind of uh, post-war uh, youth movement that happened, uh, the kind of new France that was orbiting around people like Albert Camus or Jean-Paul Sartre or Jean-Luc Godard uh, or any of these other individuals, uh, this new French culture that culminated in the kind of student protest of 1968, uh, the new France wanted to make a very clear break with the old France. And perhaps the fact that Cocteau was this kind of persona non grata whilst being a very adored celebrity, uh, like Cocteau was simultaneously both, you know, this kind of... Uh, uh, Man on a win streak and a person on grata, which the Moriac scandals, for instance, uh, very much demonstrate. But, but anyway, that person on grata aspect endeared Cocteau to some of the figures in the, the new French scene, such as Jean Luc Godard of François Truffaut. Uh, so that, uh, I think Cocteau said that he was either friends or acquaintances with Jean, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. So um, uh, I, I don't entirely know how connected he was uh, with the kind of specific individuals uh, in the kind of newer scene. But like uh, just saying that, uh, that in 1960 Coc- Cocteau was already uh, an old hand when it came to... Uh, all kinds of artistic scandals, and the Testament of Orpheus just represents the most recent kind of scandal for him, in that uh, when, the, when the French post-war culture had finally shifted from the kind of uh, uh, old school to the new school, uh, orbiting around the individuals like Sartre and Camus and Godard, uh, Cocteau was very much accused of being this kind of irrelevant figure of the past that had nothing to address to the newer generation, that Cocteau would have nothing to address to the kind of post-war uh, scene. In that uh, if, uh, if the kind of popular front era that Cocteau sort of grew up around, uh, if, if, if there is sort of a grandly humanistic tradition that orbits around something like Jean Renoir's Grand Illusion or Rules of the Game, which has a famous line of a person saying that everyone has their reasons. Like, uh, that humanism that Cocteau very much was trafficking in, and, you know, like, people don't think of Jean Cocteau in that kind of continuum of Renoir's Grand Illusion and Rules of the Game, but he very much comes from that kind of line, and, you know, people started openly mocking the kind of everyone has their reasons uh, society that 
the older order would have represented. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the Marxist student radicals, they couldn't care less what reasons everyone else had. They thought that, you know, theirs was the revolution and uh, they came to restore something to society that they thought that it didn't have in uh, a sufficient quantity and they didn't care about anybody else's reason. So the kind of uh, uh, lack of partisan belligerence in Cocteau was very much held against him. And in that non-fiction book that I referenced earlier in this video, where somebody was very much dismissing this one event in Cocteau's Testament of Orpheus, where uh, Cocteau was uh, uh, in... A trial was held uh, on Cocteau about the charge of him being innocent. And uh, this... Uh, this critic slash historian very much thought that it was it was kind of emblemat emblematic to what he perceived as the kind of stupidity and pointlessness uh, and uh, kind of precious quirkiness in Testament of Orpheus that somebody would be sentenced for being innocent. But the kind of contextualized version of that is that in the kind of partisan politics of Jean-Luc Godard or Sartre or whoever, is that uh, being innocent was very much uh, held against a person in that, uh, you know, you needed to fight the good fight and you needed to take a side and you needed to be a rebel with a cause. Uh, and somebody like Jean Cocteau, who basically retained his bipartisan core, uh, much like somebody like Jean Renoir more or less did. I mean, there is this kind of uh, quality of an innocent to them and uh, the kind of newer order of the kind of French uh, culture very much rejected that. They didn't think that that was virtuous. They didn't think that that was admirable. They didn't think that there was any kind of attraction to them. They just thought that you were slow and pointless and uh, you just didn't really fit in uh, to their kind of uh, social uh, visions. Uh, in that uh, there is a point to uh, a lot of those kind of more opaque seeming segments to Testament of Orpheus such as Cocteau being uh, tried for being an innocent in that... Uh, it isn't any kind of would-be witty play on words in fine in that that might be the superficial aspect to it, but there is a substance behind it, which is the kind of history of aesthetics in the post-war scene. Uh, and again, uh, knowing all of that doesn't necessarily render all of those things enjoyable as they don't for me, but certainly there is a greater point to them, which is what some accuse the movie of lacking. You know, I, I think that the kind of secret to Testament of Orpheus is this idea that Cocteau is accused of being irrelevant, uh, that he's this kind of... Uh, that, that the younger order would accuse him of being this kind of uh, cutesy theatrical nobody, and how Cocteau addresses it is that he chooses to revel in it. He not only doubles down, but he triples down, quadruples down on everything that people accuse uh, him of making himself a nobody in this age of Sartre, or age of Camus, or Jean-Luc Godard. In that uh, he, he accepts being a nobody, he accepts being cute, he accepts being theatrical, irrelevant, all of that, that, all of that stuff, and he just builds this monument to all of the things that people accused him of being and saying that you are right, that I would be all of these things and he just revels in them and sort of uh, forces people to coexist with all of these things that he was accused of being. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is this kind of a coyness to Testament of Orpheus as I see it in that uh, uh, I think the film was made because François Truffaut uh, won a jury prize at was it the Cannes Film Festival for 400 Blows. 
And uh, Truffaut gave his prize money to Cocteau so that he could fund this movie because, uh, you know, the, the free market, as it were, wouldn't be particularly interested in Cocteau's, uh, you know, uh, him bowing out of the film scene with this kind of a very quirky uh, curveball farewell in that that uh, Certainly the rest of the scene couldn't care less, it's just because some of the young guards, such as Truffaut, supported Cocteau. That's why he was just able to have some sort of a final moment uh, in that uh, I don't know whether Truffaut was fully satisfied with the movie, I don't know whether uh, Cocteau himself was fully satisfied with the movie, without whether any of the individuals who were there in some, some sort of cameo form or whatever, but like... Uh, it is sort of Cocteau, uh, it's like Cocteau wrestling with his own reputation and sort of meeting the public halfway in that these are some of the ways in which you see me, these are some of the ways in which I uh, coexist with this kind of uh, accusation slash assessments of how it is that you think that I am and whatever. And, you know, it's never entirely at face value, in that there is this kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, when, when Cocteau uh, acknowledges some of the criticism leveled against him, it, it's, it's almost like there is this kind of uh, uh, sarcastic, uh, cheeky, patronizing way in which Cocteau just takes in all of that criticism and uh, crafts some sort of one final movie from it. I mean, that's certainly how I see the project. And again, uh, I don't think any of those contextualizing elements make the movie enjoyable exactly. I think the kind of uh, uh, episodic nature to which, uh, you know, like the kind of vignette, uh, almost stream of conscious quality to it, um, I don't think it really adds up to anything as its own aesthetic uh, reality, but um, uh, you know, it, when taken in the context of Cocteau's entire body of work, his history, as it were, the history of uh, post-war French scene, you know, there's definitely something there there, I just don't think that it's necessarily something much. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if you take Cocteau's career, uh, you know, altogether, there is a lot of good work, a lot of inventive work, uh, whether in book or film form or whatever, uh, whether fiction or non-fiction, so that uh, I don't think that there's necessarily, like, the people who only want to look at Cocteau's film work, they perhaps, because he only made so many movies, they perhaps feel a slightly higher necessity to think that the uh, Testament of Warfare has to be something so that we would have a lot of Cocteau films to enjoy. But I, I don't really, I don't look at it like that, because if, if Cocteau has some sort of a you know, silly musical play, whatever, called Lovers of the Eiffel Tower or something, which was very much meant as some sort of a knowing farce uh, and some sort of a parody of some of the things that uh, were circulating in the art at the time and some of the audience expectation and, uh, you know, mocking some of the standard operating procedures. So that just like... Uh, you know, people who are fans of Cocteau in general, they don't feel any kind of necessity to feel any type of way about Lovers of the Eiffel Tower or whatever that play is called in English. Uh, they don't feel any type of way to feel... Uh, they don't feel any inclination to feel any particular type of way towards that. And I would uh, recommend that people take a similar approach to something like... Uh, uh, testament of Orpheus, in that it really, <laughs> you know, it feels like an insufficient explanation, but the film, it just is what it is. It's not, it's not anything grand. It's like, 
you know, you can't exactly treat a Randy Newman song the way that you would treat either a Led Zeppelin song or a Bob Dylan song, in that it's something a bit different and it's appreciated a bit differently. So, you know, I think that uh, if Cocteau wanted anyone to appreciate Testament of Orpheus, I think that he would want to appreciate it as some sort of a uh, achievement in being cheeky in kind of a coy manner that uh, I don't think quite, a, quite enough people necessarily fully appreciate, but there's definitely something there. there. But uh, uh, anyway, um, I just wanted to uh, mount some sort of a defense of Cocteau's uh, Testament of Orpheus. Uh, I don't know how many people are interested in it, but you know, it's just my two cents about the project. Anyway, I think that that was pretty much it for now. So uh, thank you for watching. And uh, if you like this video, there's earlier videos on this channel that I would hope that some people consider giving a chance to. But anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.